Hello, welcome to Dear Dwyery from sunny San Francisco. I think the last one I did of these was in like October before I came over and uh, I don't know, I talk on Twitter and Tumblr so much that I'm, I'm I don't really know why I fucking do these, uh, but some folks have been asking so I'm like, I better. It's been like October, November, December, January, February, March. Have I been here six months then? October, last week in October. November, December, January, February, March, April. Okay, the end of this month, I think I've been here six months. That is fucking crazy. Um, last time I did one of these, I was drinking a can of Strongbow. Things have gone up in the world. I am now drinking Alaskan White. It's from Alaska. You know, because it's got a fucking polar bear in the front. Wheat air brewed with spices. It's a good thing that wasn't fizzy because I'm just lying this on the fucking laptop. By the way, I forget who got me this. Is it my brother or my ex? It's pretty good. Space Invader. Screw to open computer. Screw to open other things. Bottle opener. Never leave home without it. Yes, that tastes like a, like a relatively cheap wheat beer. Great. All right, what the fuck to talk about? Um, I got a bunch of questions. Uh, people that sound where give you the tour of the place if you want. Um, just my room. I don't want to weird out my flatmates. Um, I'm living in San Francisco in um a part of the town called Presidio Heights, which is rather nice. Here's my back garden, which is awfully, awfully messy. Uh, yeah, it comes across nice. The sky's blue. The sky's either blue here or it's incredibly um cloudy um, it's gorgeous today I cycled down to uh, Drew Scanlon's place to watch Formula One this morning just a, a one instance in how weird my different my life has gotten that I'm now going to watch F1 with um, guys I've whose work I've liked from a distance for years it's really strange um, yes there's quite a lot of bottles of wine there I don't know why I kept them I actually think I kept them because there's just nothing on the walls here like, I didn't bring that much shit with me. I brought, like, what stuff was on my back. So, and, like, look at this weird... Like, this room is weird, right? Okay, bed. Great. Yeah, whatever. Like, dressers and stuff. Look at this thing. It's like a fucking fireplace. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that much shit. So, like, when I came here, like, I actually got more stuff delivered to me when I came. Like, my family bought me all this, like, photographs of my hometown and stuff. I think they were terrified I was going to forget who I was. Like, the only things I bought that are of note are, like... This like player of the year trophy and then this awesome uh, gift trophy I was given to by um, Claire who was in the game's first depression video. See, I told you I brought it. Um, but like I don't have that much to look. Like here's my glasses. Look, here are two glasses I got when I went to a beer festival thing. I literally came here with like the bags on my back. I had five bags. Uh, so when I came here, I had to buy a new TV, uh, PlayStation 4. There's a PAL 360 at the bottom, and on top of it is an NTSC one, which is my flatmates, actually. Um, I had an Xbox One there, but it was works one. Um, I built my... I got my motherboard and stuff. Um, I wrapped it up, my graphics card, things like that. And then when I got here, I basically got a power supply case. Keyboard, mouse. Um, did I buy RAM? No, just fans and shit. Um, put it all together. So that was that was quite handy, because I, I was, was going to make a loss on that um, and then here we have uh, a fish pillow which was given to me by my friends at GameSpot UK because we had Morgan T fish pillow which used to be kind of photo bombing in our videos which was Alex Goy's um, fluffy inf pillow that looks like a fish that he uh, he bought when he couldn't see the steer he couldn't sit properly in a Morgan they were racing or he couldn't see over the top and it was the only thing in the in the petrol station he could use um, that he could sit on. So we had that fish pillow and they decided to get me a fish pillow for here. This one's about five times bigger than Morgan T fish pillow. Thanks guys. The biggest thing I own in San Francisco is a fucking imitation cod or something. I don't know. Let me plug this thing back in. But yeah, it's uh, suffice to say it's been a pretty interesting, I need to get a fucking haircut. Uh, it's been a pretty interesting six months. Um, I wanted to get here for so long. At that stage, it's like, do you 
the, the, the pipe dream you've had in your head for like forever, does it end up being a lot of crap? Uh, no, it turns out I absolutely love this city. I love my job. It's great. It's really good, which in and of itself is, is, is kind of trippy. It's, it's probably why it's taken me six months to, to do this because one, like just don't want to talk about any of that crap for a while and also like work has been like trying to get stuff out that I'm proud of has been like we had a lot of stuff we were working on for a long time. Um, and then for the first two months I was here, like I didn't want to talk about it until it was done. I didn't want to do one of these until the lobby was done. I didn't want to do one of these until I'd figured out the point because I'm not happy with some of the the aspects of that show that we're kind of stuck with, which I think we've kind of fixed with this season too. Um, so I didn't want to have to, I don't ever want to have to come on one of these things and like not, like lie basically or like fucking sugarcoat bullshit or something. So that's why I didn't do one, I guess. The other thing was, it took me about two months to find a place. Uh, San Francisco is insanely expensive. I'm I'm earning more here than I did in London. And the rent in London was pretty bad, like high. Like I think I was paying, before bills, I think it was £570 sterling, I think it was, a month in London. And on top of that, transport, um, and then electricity and TV and all that shit. I'm paying way more here, like way more but at least this place is safe it's in a nice part of town which is important to me because i remember when i lived in elephant and castle for that six months in london and it was the most terrifying experience of my life because it's not the same when you're in a, you're not in a country where you've got like old friends or or like old friends who were like family like people who are like like situated locally which are safe zones that you can kind of be in for a long time like you don't have that mentality when you li- when you're living in a country you don't live in or you you're not from rather so so I had close friends in London but I didn't have um it wasn't the safety net wasn't there so I guess it was what it is so when I came here I was like well there's no safety net for fucking thousands of miles so I better make sure I'm in a nice place so I'm 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 spending quite a bit I'm I've been I'll be here for another four or five months I think and then I'll I'll see where I want to stay um but the cool thing about San Francisco is like it's um it's like the it's such a small it's like seven by seven miles and uh, like the, the diversity is insane. Like it's it's why it's so expensive, I guess, because it's a tiny little landmass. But um, yeah, like the, 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 the prices are, are pretty much expensive wherever. But like in terms of like you can live down the mission and be like surrounded by, you know, well, I guess you can be surrounded by crackheads. But like you, there's like mentality down there is different to the Castro, is different to Knob Hill, is different to like like out of Richmond, out near the Pacific Coast, is like loads of fucking bars and Irish people, and then you go down south and like there's like so I think there's like Daly City is like all like Filipino and like it's just it's so and it's all in such a tiny piece of land. Like London's like that, but it's fucking spread out over. Like it's stupid how big London is in terms of like I think I think San Francisco is like seven hundred and fifty thousand people or something on that like seven by seven square um mile plot and London was I wanna say with the commuter belt something like twelve million. Uh so yeah, it's a lot more condensed. Which means save s- saving money tip number one, buy yourself a friggin' bike. Um because also this place is just ridiculously beautiful to to cycle around um it gets the, the hills are a son of a bitch uh, but your legs get used to them i guess um but it's great yeah well, this place is great i wake up every morning i cycle to work it takes me 25 minutes i do my stuff i've got a standing desk it's weird um the work is it's good it's it reminds me of when i was halfway through escape from being stupid and knowing not not knowing like it can be better and then and trying to figure out how to do it and that's where I am now um with the lobby and the point um the lobby is a if, if you don't know the lobby is our weekly live show it's on uh, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. the lobby is an interesting uh production because it involved so many people it involved our entire live team it involved our uh, video team on the other side like our for want of a better term our like on-demand video team um and then it also because it involves so many people it involves you know executives it involves social it involves engineers everyone and um, so everyone has their own kind of um 
uh, say in it, I guess. So creatively, it can be like it can be like herding cats. Um, I had an idea of how what I wanted it to, or what I what I imagined it would be, and obviously, being the host, I had um, a certain sort of say and a piece of ownership around it, I guess. Maybe, um, maybe more so than other folks did. Um, this was the, you know, and in the back of my head, this is also like, okay, the reason why you wanted to work in San Francisco specifically for GameSpot was because you watched on the spot. It was because of Rich Gallup and Jeff Kurtzman and what those shows were and how you felt about them and stuff. So at the same time, it was also like this weird fucking wish fulfillment thing where I just needed it to be great. I feel like it's mostly, it's mostly there. There are two problems. One is... Does that show exist anymore? Do people care about that show? I think the live portion of it is worthwhile to have because there aren't many shows that do that anymore. Destructor obviously stopped doing their live one um, when Max left. Um, and then like uh, like Up at Noon is essentially a predominantly on-demand show. Um, I think ours should be a predominantly on the, or at least we should produce it for that. We've kind of gotten around to that. I think I have to do a better job of presenting for that as well. Um, but it's getting there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it ticks so many boxes for us that you wouldn't think. It's not just about numbers on the live stream. It also like is an excuse for us to get names in. So we got Vince Ampella. We got Peter Molyneux. It kind of helps us within the gaming world to be more relevant. Um, it's something like you should need to have. You need to have a flag book, uh, flagship show, especially on a site like GameSpot, which has like just dozens of like separate things going on. We've got live streams. We've got the highlights of them. We've got the we've got like this original programming deck with like five. Now it's five shows a week, and then we have like our features, which aren't in that. And then outside of that, we got news and reviews, which kill everything in terms of traffic. Um. Like it's it's kind of important to have some sort of pillar where all the disparate elements can converge, so we can have news, we can have people who are on like individual shows. Like, cause for a while there, it was like we're like a YouTube network. Like, it was like I have my show, Johnny has his show, Seb has his, Cam has his show, Seb and Cam have their show. Like Jess is in Australia, you know. A lot of that I, mentality came out of like a necessity thing where we had individuals you know the uk team that was that was built out there that chris built was was all people who are autonomous they could work on their own stuff and uh, whereas the us team is more we have people for reviews we have people in front of camera behind camera so i guess that's why that ended up being that way with all these different individual shows with like figureheads on them um which i think is a good thing in a way because it lets you it lets somebody take ownership of their show and have fun with it uh but what it does for the site is that it kind of turns it into like, what the fuck is it? Is this YouTube now? Is that what's happened? Like, um, and I think that doesn't give across the right like uh, mentality or because games are about just fucking having like, chatting with people and having fun and like, like just like as an example, look at sites like Rev Three where like they're all involved and they're all videos. Look at like IGN where they. Like, when they pull in people on up at noon or, or giant bomb, which is essentially a site completely built around conversations happening. Like the guys don't even do like video reviews anymore. They don't even do that many reviews anymore, but like stuff like even like Tang, like as much as I love Tang, I don't think that like does as well as when they just had everyone in the room together. So like essentially giant bomb is now like an on-demand video streaming service. Uh, and it's like, that's how that works. And that's why like people, I don't know, like, enjoy those conversations and those people so we didn't have that for a long time so i think the lobby is like good for that it kind of it does a lot it makes us change about how we produce video instead of it like this cookie cutter thing like it was important when the show was being produced that we didn't have a set schedule that was like rigid that we didn't like section off the show too hard because then we'd have to like it's like if you wanted to create a new show on on gamespot now because we've got so many individual slots and programs that are very defined it's hard to put something in there without like making graphics first, finding a schedule first, what's its pitch, all that stuff. Whereas on the lobby, thankfully, when it was being produced, we kept it nice and loose so that we can throw in and whatever we want. We can kind of roll with the punches. That's especially going to matter when we're like post E3 and there's fuck all games coming out and we have to make sure it's entertaining. So it's been fun. It's been, it's been awesome to like work with everyone on it. Like it just, a project like that reminds you of how many amazingly talented people you work with that are just like so much better um at like individual parts of it than than like than anyone else on the team like there are people that just 
you're great at that, you're great at that, you're great at that. And then we have like other folks who are good at like doing every, who are like good at doing a bunch of stuff and like finding the right people in the right slots and all that is like, yeah, very satisfying. So I feel like we're in that slot now. Like everyone knows their, their position and everyone's like happy with it. Um, uh, yeah, and we're going to PAX uh, the week after next to do a live one, which looks like the dumbest thing in the world. I get, I'll get into that later. Um, and then the... I always feel like I'm, I need a drink. I fucking... This is why I don't like doing these, because I'm fucking talking to my laptop. And behind it is a fish pillow. So I feel like I'm just talking to this asshole. Tell me about video on demand, Danny. Jesus. This is alright. And then there's the, the point, which is now in season two. Uh, we got swapped into the Friday slot as part of a sort of a reshuffle of um, the original pro programming slate. Of course, Feedback is over. Fair, yeah, sad to hear it. Um, obviously, Johnny left um, GameSpot UK a couple of months ago. Um, like, honestly, about that, like, I'm, I'm kind of delighted for him because I feel like, like Johnny has got so many talents that don't fit nicely into just video game journalism, like not just GameSpot, just like pr across the board. Like he's working on this RPG tabletop role playing game, RPG, RPG, I can't, RPG, um, which looks awesome. And like he does all of his acting on the side and um, whittling. <laughs> he's just super talented, and I'm happy that he has. Like I feel like this is him taking a leap into like doing something that he's actually gonna love, love, love. Um, and when you have a job that you love, like I feel like I there's nothing else I'd want to do rather than this. Like you can be nothing but happy for someone else who's like trying to trying to find that. So I'm I'm delighted for him. Um yeah, I guess for whatever reason it's been it's been it's been shelved. Great run. Like I think it was a year and a half. Maybe it was longer. Which is insane. Like escape totaled was probably half a year, I think. Um split over long periods of time. Maybe it was longer, maybe it was three quarters of a year. Um so yeah, incredible. Uh, longest running show, I think, that was up until when it was running. It was the longest running show we had had at that point, I think. Um, so that's so the point is essentially taking the Friday slot, which Fibacula left. Um, I'm working with Andy Bauman, who is, uh, he was hired originally. You may, if any of you guys are giant bomb users, you would have remembered him. He was doing like TriCaster stuff um, for Vinny and Drew. Uh, for a while um he's kind of come onto the video side on gamespot um, and he predominantly a lot of his stuff you never get to see on the site and he's probably um our most talented shooter i think it's fair to say like cameraman the dude is just he has an eye for it and i love working with him i love i've always like when i moved over here it was like i want to work with andy as much as i can um so yeah, the point that like the idea with the point was to he was taking over basically editing my pieces. I edited the point up until I think it was the second week in February, and then it became the first show I ever did that I didn't edit, which was a bit weird. But giving it to Andy was okay. I was like, okay, I'm all right with that. Um, it's not like I'm a control freak, but it was just it was something you know when you've worked on something on your own for for so long, it's it's a bit like I guess having somebody mind your baby for the first time. If your baby was a internet video about video games where the Irish guy curses too much. Um, and then he, uh, oh, dirt, I better clean up. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, he was doing that and it was kind of just like, it was like giving Andy a grunt job, like edit my stupid video where all you do is stick B-roll over the top. And then I was just doing the intro and outro with the top and bottom. And we had no time to do it. Those script, we have so many meetings on a Monday that those scripts were getting written in an afternoon so I could cut the voiceover, give it to him on Tuesday morning. He could get the B-roll, edit it, and then Wednesday morning we would shoot the video links and it would be up by noon. Because it's up, if you're watching this in the UK, like, that show goes up at 7, but that's like noon for us over here. So it, when I moved here, it took a day off of the um, off the production time, added a shitload of meetings, and then I, we had the lobby on Tuesday, so I was I couldn't do anything. Um, so we were just shitting those out, like everyone from February, like even the ones that were kind of okay, were done in such a rush. And it, like, there's nothing worse. What are now? There are loads of things worse. Murder, but there is nothing more f 
few things more frustrating in, in my working life than having the ability to do, make something great and put it on a platform like GameSpot and falling short week after week. And that's what that fucking felt like. And it was killing me. And it was, I think it was killing Andy because he was basically just doing grunt work editing for me. And he was doing a great job of it, but he was happy, I think, but we, we, we knew we could do better. So basically, now that it's been moved to Friday, we've got more time. We've added like an extra, I'd say even like last week's, we added a half a day extra production time. I think we'll probably add an extra day and hopefully it showed. Um, now I want to make, get them to be like less whiny, less like we'll talk about the talking points that are negative when we can, but like championship more like when we did with the FMS when it was like, let's talk about stuff that people actually want to get behind and like, you know, like let's talk about the history of Half-Life. Yeah. Fucking who wouldn't want to talk about that? That's like, that's fun. Um, doing that and doing, making it funnier and doing more, um, on location shoots and then putting people in as well. So. Similar to how the point was like, the point was very much a, this is how I need to do this to produce it in the UK because of the time frame, because of the, the fact that I was doing it on my own, because we had a studio with a, with a, a, a screen behind, a green screen behind it, or a, a, and that, the white screen is what I did Escape from a Stupid on because that's what we had. Um, so now that like, it was very much a, okay, now let's look at what we have here. We've got like this amazing editor who also shoots really good, like incredible stuff. Um, all these awesome cameras, the green screen in the US office is actually kind of shitty. Um, our production time has been scaled. It was just like looking at it all, seeing what the best type of show I think would be, and then matching up the pieces. And like I'm, I think I think Friday's episode could have been better. Like I've learned loads of stuff. Like I think the thumbnail was wrong because a lot of people didn't know it was there because they're used to seeing the red thumbnail for the point. Silly little fucking things like that. But like overall, I'm I'm I'm. I'm excited about it. I'm happy by it because we kind of have this like no rules mentality to it. Like the f before, <laughs> before we put it up, Andy like edited it and I hadn't seen like a, f a near final one yet. And he said, uh, <laughs> I did the walk in where I walk along the beach and in my head when I walked, it was like 10 seconds. It was actually like 20 and he played it for me and I, and I paused. I'm like, we can't do the whole thing. It can't be 20 seconds of me walking. Like people turn off the fucking video. And he was like, oh, come, come on, watch it. So I watched it. I don't, like it works way better than if you'd cut it. Like it's it's so long, it's dumb. And what we did to make sure that it would like not be too bad is the logo used to have everything in it, like season two, episode one, and the title. So we split it so it only came up at the start, the point season two, episode one, and then it went and then the title came up, which was just enough movement in the frame to like not make it like egregiously boring. Um, but I think it's all worth it when that that like sweep shot comes in because it's so unexpected and the camera makes stuff look so good so it almost looks like film um and i was going to run into the ocean the plan was to run into the ocean in my suit but that suit i then realized was dry clean only and it cost me like bought it for a wedding a couple of years ago i think it was like 300 pounds and i was like i can't i can't ruin <laughs> the most expensive look like, at like I, I wear clothes like a piece of shit like i'm wearing i'm wearing like basketball shorts right now like it's the one piece of clothing i have that's actually kind of half you know respectable so i couldn't do it uh yeah so that's an update on the two of those i guess um the lobby uh i think we need to promote it better um the, i need to, need to do some trailers for it it's all about loosening it up it's about loosening up production loosening up people who are on like making more of a hangout thing um less of a worrying less about when shit goes wrong you know what i mean like when we had we had max last week if you watched it when when his, he had this green screen spill on him when he was doing his Maxwell McBargains thing. And like the the like the like easy production, like the, the how you get out of this thing is very much like a cut out of it. But like you could see it was fucked. So it was just, I was, I told him to like step back into it. So he'd like go totally green, like stuff like that. Like having it so that everyone is on board and knows that that's the right way to do it. That like you, in, you, in, you like embrace the dumb like people like that they can see the puppet strings like that type of mentality was basically like the most important thing so i'm happy for that i think we need to we're all we're all learning on it as well and figuring out what people like i just think we need to grab a bigger audience to kind of um to properly assess it and then the point kind of similar like it's all about making sure that making something that people actually want to watch like that's the thing about traffic it's like some people say you shouldn't live by traffic or you know such and such amount of views is enough to do your job Personally, I think if you're in a situation like this where you have a, you're 
producing video on a massive website that you're lucky enough to do it, that you have a sense of responsibility um, to make sure that you're making stuff that um, resonates with the mo most people. So I see traffic as, like, unless you're doing top five tits in gaming, like, <laughs> I see traffic as a pretty good barometer of if you're doing stuff that's worthwhile. So I like to see the numbers. I like to see the numbers get higher. As long as I'm not producing some shitty bullshit, but I hope you guys know that I probably won't do that. And if I do, I know a lot of you guys will, will tell me I'm doing it, uh, which is good. Um, and the, the missing one in that is Random Encounter. I'm not mad on our on our live streaming setup in that room. Um, it doesn't. I miss the microphone and the intimacy. Like we have a where we do that. There is a lot of ambient noise. People listening. We production people like. It's for a different type of production. I don't think it's for a random encounter. Maybe it works for stuff like multiple players where there's multiple people involved. But for Ori, like I'm trying to set up some sort of a get back in a small room with a microphone so I can do the switching myself. You know, make what the fuck is it? Make like pull the microphone away when I'm laughing. So like currently we wear clip on, so when we laugh it actually distorts the mic, so it actually ruins the funniest parts of the shows. So that's why I've not been editing stuff very often because I think the edits are kind of shit because they're edits of subpar shows. So I'm trying to fix that. Um, but there's just so many balls in the air at the moment that I have to... It was all about the lobby for the past couple of weeks and then making the point, making sure the point was good and we've got packs next week and it's a lot of, a lot of stuff, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's that's kind of it. I'm going to go do some questions because uh, um, i got a couple on the Twitter and the Tumblr. Uh, all right. Dan Mohorek asks, how many breeders are too many breeders? I don't know. Ask me in. I've actually lost weight since I got here. Um, maybe it's the cycling. I've lost like, like three quarters of a stone, which is pretty great, kind of. I'm almost at like the what I was about two years ago. I don't know, about half a stone. So sorry, that's about seven pounds. I'm about seven pounds away from being what I was when I was running 10Ks, which was about two and a half years ago. Um, fuck, it wasn't. It was three years ago. God damn. I left Ireland five years ago? Sick. Shit. It's terrifying. Um, yeah, which is good. So, yeah, burritos are delicious here, though. Uh, okay, questions, 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 questions. So many questions. I don't know, it's just Twitter hasn't formatted properly. Excuse me, I'm going to drink some beer while it reloads. Mm. 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 La 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 la. Ooh. Sorry, filtering out the weirdo ones. Which shooter franchise is hurt the most by Titanfall? Halo, Call of Duty, Battlefield, all take a hit in some way, but who gets hurt the most? I think it's more. Oh, I'm conscious of becoming some sort of fucking Titanfall evangelist. Because I did a bunch of videos about how I like that game. Um, I don't think I. I think it's more a shot on the arm for the whole. You'll see when the new Call of Duty is shown. Put it that way. From what I've heard, the new Call of Duty is doing stuff which seems to be a direct reaction to what Titanfall is. I. I think that every it it shook the deck. Like that's how what I feel about it. I don't think it hurts one individual franchise. If it's going to pull people away from a franchise, I think. Call of Duty, clearly, because hey, Halo is, is kind of defunct at this stage. Like, they haven't released a game in so long. Battlefield stuff is very much its own thing. Like, the, the reason they were going for the Call of Duty audience was kind of weird for a long time. They need to fucking sort their shit out with their patches and stuff. It's insane. Um, like, Battlefield's doing more damage to Battlefield than anyone else right now. Um, uh, so it's probably Call of Duty, but, like, Call of Duty's game sells millions. Like, it's not going to cut that much into it. I, I think it's more of a long-term shaking the deck thing. Um, although with E3 this year and the big first party games being announced, like perhaps what happens in the next six months will be more revolutionary to FPS than Titanfall was. I can't tell. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, I think it's more of a, just a general impact on design rather than they're like stealing from one particular game's basket. Um, 
that was Anthony uh, Calvanes, 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 Calvanes. I don't know. It's a pretty good name. Nice work. Uh, Damien Burns asks, "Does it feel weird to be living there, or does it feel like home?" <coughs> Uh, it, still, <coughs> it still feels weird, but if I imagine living in London or Ireland right now, it would feel weirder. Um, it feels weird in a, this place is too beautiful and everyone's leave kind of way. Um, but it does feel like home, like I come home and it feels like home. Um, but then ever since I left Waterford, I've, I've been quite happy wherever I've been. Like I, I travel light and I, I'm happy wherever I land in places kind of thing. So um, I'm not surprised, but uh, yeah, like I've got friends outside work, you know, I've, you know, like relationships and just, yeah, if I've got like a local shopkeeper who knows me and, you know, shit like that. All that little stuff that like, it's weird being in a place where nobody knows anything about you prior to six months ago. Like, for the most part, like I was working with folks in GameSpot for two years and then like, I've known a lot of the UK, US people from being, like, a fan of GameSpot for a long time. So, like, Ryan Mack and, and then, the, like, Giant Bomb guys and, like, Dan Mahorek and, like, all these people who have been, like, involved in GameSpot for a long time that I've known of. I've known, but it's, like, it's not the same. That's been weird. That's actually... The weirdest thing is probably that. It's probably having normal day-to-day -day relationships with people you were a fan of for so long. Like, and making sure that, like yeah that like you are normal to them and that you're like it's a it's a bit of a mind fuck like it's weird good like drinking with alexis and it's like i used to watch him on professional fight you know what i mean like it's it's strange but um no like it, it does feel like home it feels like I, I i the one thing i'll say about san francisco is this i've never wanted to not leave a place i've lived in like this i wanted to leave ireland i love ireland i wanted to leave waterford i wanted to leave cork when i was in london for two years actually i was i would have been happy to leave the only reason i stayed for the extra two years was because I, I finally got my, my chance at GameSpot. I don't want to leave here. It's great. So, yeah, I guess that, that probably makes it feel like home. Um, Andrew McMillan, how did you get where you are today from Ireland, San Francisco? I'm new to the games industry, been wanting in for years. Uh, where do you work at? Producer at Natural Motion Games. Nice work, sir. You make actual things. I just, I just talk about them. Uh, uh, long story short, because I've told this so many times, um, uh, I'm sure there's another video where I talk about it on, on this YouTube channel. Um, uh, I, I was a fan of GameSpot for years, I moved to London so I would get work in GameSpot UK, it took two years, I eventually did, then I wanted to come out here, it took two years, and then it did. So, uh, stupid amounts of specific planning around trying to work for GameSpot in San Francisco, which somehow, via a mixture of hard work and tremendous good fortune worked out. So don't do that. Don't put all your eggs in one basket like I did. Or at least have a backup plan, which I kind of did with the web design work, but I don't know. I have an emotional backup plan. If this hadn't have worked out, I'd probably be hanging from a tree. No, I'm not joking. Um, Ian Kelly, are you still happy with that pun? Truly happy. Dear Dwyery, sure. I didn't even come up with it, mate. Um, that's, a, that's a Jane Douglas. I need to pay her every time I do one of these videos. Shall I Dwyer another day and come Dwine with me? They're pretty good. Uh, Moise Siddiqui asks, thinking of doing more video documentary stuff like video games versus depression or was it a once-off personal thing? I definitely want to do more of those. I feel like the point with season two and how it looks will allow me to do more of those, like more cinematic. Um, that is probably the single most rewarding thing I've ever done. <laughs> By nature of what it's about, and then saying that extra life is probably close to that as well. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm still really happy with what that was. I, I don't think it's perfect. Like, there's lots of things about it I, I think are a bit hammy or a bit over the top, or I'm not really sure if it communicates super effectively. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy it is the way it is because it was like the first time I'd edited something like that, um, or shot. Um, I'd like to do more of them, but it's when the story. You can't force it. Like, we try to force it on the point sometimes. Like, here's the latest thing that you get pissed off about. Like, the problem with it being a weekly show where it's like an op-ed is you have to be, I'm fucking pissed off. And I don't want to do that. I don't, you know, I I don't want to be an angry gamer dude or whatever. So, like, that's the, yeah. So, I guess with those ones, you need to, there's a couple of stories that I'm kind of considering doing 
Like there was one I wanted to do in London about guys who chip consoles. There's another one that we might do when the guys got in contact with some guys who do aimbots, maybe do something like, like something like that, something that's more associated with gaming. Because that was very much a piece about depression and gaming was just kind of a hook for people. Like it was a bait and switch. Like at the end of it, it's like, do games have depression? Have depression? No, not really. They don't make it worse. They don't make it better necessarily. They might do both actually, but it doesn't matter. Go to the fucking doctor. <laughs> like that was always the. That was well. That was what was presented as the final thing. But I, in my head, I kind of always thought that's probably what it's going to be, right? Uh, so I'd like to do more stuff that's actually game related. Um, I'm actually since I've done one of these, actually, it's actually been nominated in the Games Journalism Prize, which is kind of a it's a new prize with a couple of um, uh, prominent industry writers and heads uh, vote on it. Um, it was in the first round of shortlists. I don't know who submitted it. I don't, I'm almost, I keep, like, I, I almost positive I didn't, because I don't think I submitted that thing to anything. But sometimes I get drunk on the internet, so I don't know. But I think somebody else did on my behalf. So if you did, thank you very much. Um, I, I can't, for some reason, I think, I'd love to know who did it, but then I think, maybe I got drunk and I did, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but, you know, who fucking knows. Or if you work on that prize thing, please let me know if I drunkenly submitted it myself. Um... But that's not getting picked for like months ahead. But what I am happy about is that it's the only video piece that's on that list. I think it's the only video piece that's ever been um, shortlisted. And I also think it's the only one GameSpot's ever done. So very, very proud. Um, don't expect to win anything out of it, but it's, it's awesome. Um, David Owen, who was actually in that documentary, um, is, not, is in it four times, I think. He's got four nominations on the shortlist. Um, and also, he still doesn't have a fucking nine to five job in the games industry. So, if you are watching this and you're based in the UK or you do freelance work in the US and you need somebody who's an incredibly talented writer who will probably work for much less than you should pay, I should say that, who is like, give this fucking dude a break. Like, it's so dumb. The guy's got like nominations coming out of his arse and. The amount of times this happens actually with like people who are successful within our field who then get totally shafted by the industry is mind boggling. But um yeah. DJ Owen, follow him on Twitter as well, it's a cool dude. Um next question. Um drink some more. Mm. Um, I think that's basically it. Mm. Simon O'Connor, ah, friend, good friend. What, what's one Waterford thing San Francisco needs and one San Francisco thing Waterford needs? There's a Lombard Street in both here and Waterford. The one here is a tourist attraction and doesn't have a chipper, so maybe the maybe the, a chipper or a chippy. When you say chipper over here, people think you mean like a fucking wood chipper. It's one of the many... I've probably said stuff now, like I use the word store all the time. I say soccer, but then you kind of say soccer in Ireland because we've got Gaelic football, so it doesn't really count. But like, yeah, my dialect always changes when I go places. Same with London, but it's probably been more drastic here. Um, uh, I don't know. Sunshine. Weed. What if we could do it more smelling marijuana all the time when you walk around and having really easy legal access to it <laughs> i've heard i've heard it's great i've never done it myself um waterford what could what could san francisco what do i miss from waterford turkish food here is shit and i have a turkish gurk who we work with who makes all the like graphics motion graphics for GameSpot. is turkish he's called gurk and he's a turk it's great it's so easy remember his name um he uh yeah he says that like there's something weird about american turkish food so like you can't get a decent donor meat and chip here like donor kebabs and stuff are just like they call it shawarma it's all fucking weird and they serve it like like it's western foods they don't just give it to you in your fucking hand all greasy and nasty and i was like is that the way it's supposed to be or is like european turkish food really fucked up and i don't know he's like no no, no. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be just like, Ugh. whereas here it's all like, oh, you get your fucking knife, you know, it's dumb. Shit food. But then there's in and out is here, which is amazing. It's creature comforts. Baked beans. I can't get fucking baked beans here. 
Like whenever I'm training, the best thing to eat in the world is baked beans. It's cheap, high in protein, fills you. Great. Stick it on some bread. <whistles> done. Lunch for like a month. Easy. Drop a little weight. Put on some muscle. No baked beans. Get fucking pinto beans. Get refried beans. Get refried pinto beans. You, no. For whatever reason, you can't get fucking baked beans. And then sometimes you'll find it and it'll be that weird shit they have in England where it's like baked beans with like sausages in it. You're like, whoa. No, that's... Don't do that. Like, I don't, I don't know who the fuck made that like a staple. It's like potatoes, but there's carrots stuck through them. It's like, no, 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 I just want the I, I'm component parts. I'll make it myself. Like, you just heat up sausage. It's weird. So I got pasta today. I'm going to make a sausage bake thing. But I don't know. I don't know why baked beans freaks them out so much. It's like there's so many Irish bars and English bars around here, and they all sell English breakfast, so they're getting it from somewhere, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, that goat sheep that was born was pretty rad. Oh, Tumblr. Tumblr questions. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Here's one. Art Fiat, who is thick with the questions. Uh, do you ever experience a situation where a game you really enjoyed was officially reviewed on GameSpot by someone else and received a really low score? What is it like when you're at an office full, when you're in an office full of unique individuals with their own personal tastes that comes down to a single person to determine what GameSpot's official stance on a game is? Uh, I think it's better the way it is now than it was before. Now it's like we've stopped trying to... Like a couple of years ago, I believe they were trying to do like subjective reviews. It's like, or object... Subjective. Objective? <laughs> Is there alcohol in you? Um, trying to have it so it was like a sort of like a hive mind mentality to what the review is. Now they're very much a um, like individual's perspective on it, so an objective, um, which uh, subject. Jesus Christ, I don't know. I can't fucking remember which one's which. Uh, but it still goes through QA. So if you have thoughts, like if they still have to. You have to make sure that the reasons why you're giving something a score are valid. Uh, there are definitely instances where we've... I wouldn't say where it's gotten a really low score. Like, I think it's usually within one. But, like, I hate the arbitrary... Like, it, more so, I disagree with people's stances on stuff. Like, I disagree that this is a good game because of this, or this is a bad game because of this. Like, but that's to be expected, you know what I mean? Like, it's... The way I feel about games, reviews, sites... Is that like, I wouldn't ask my friend who loves ice cream and hates beer what beer I should buy. Or like, prefers one over the other. Like, I don't think you can read a review without understanding where that person comes from. And then I don't think you should, like, if you read a review from somebody who clearly doesn't agree from your standpoint, like, you can still get something from that review, but I wouldn't, I, w I would use it less than I would from like, somebody who I think I am, can I can empathize with. So that's just like life. Like you can't, there is no way to, like there is a way, there is certainly a way to give a, you know, this is the number I think because of, you know, this is what I think the audience wants. And like try and hit some sort of fucking median between the people who are like, really like first person shooters, only like them a little bit, or like people who are like, are like pro gamers, like, try and like hit the median to piss off the fewest people you can do that if you want but like fuck that like that'd be way worse than getting you know abuse for giving fucking zelda a seven like, get, like specifically about that one like if that game if zelda games came out and they were called fucking johnny johnny o'leary's fun time forest hunt and it was the mechanically the exact same thing and looked sh slightly worse nobody would buy it like fuck zelda man it's the same fucking game every year like great i'm delighted you grew up playing nintendo games your whole life but like unless it does something meaningful like eh, like the new one great apparently it's a wonderful ds game brilliant mechanically it's great like i don't think that game's getting game of the year unless loads of our staff play the old ones and have this nostalgic hook to it. And that's kind of okay as well, but then, like, I'm not going to get something out of that review because I grew up playing Commodore games. I don't give a shit about Zelda. You know, so, like, even there's an instance where, like, to be honest, I actually agreed with it for Game of the Year because people were so passionate about it, but, like, there's an example of how you don't always have to agree, like, 
you don't always have to have the same belief as someone to agree with their stance on it. I agree that that should have been a game of the year. I agree that the people in that room loved it. And I actually voted for it as like a soft vote in support of that. But I don't think it is, personally. So like there's your, if that makes any sense. Um, but no, I can't think of any that's been like hugely in terms of score, you know, whatever. Most games are between six and nine because most games are made to a high standard. Um, because they're expensive to make and they take fucking ages. That's why you get less shit games and you get shit movies. Or at least less shit games that are reviewed on game sites. We don't review like all the shovelware that comes out, which we get four or five or three. Um, <laughs> Anonymous asks, have you checked running with rifles on Steam yet? People are saying good things about it and comparing it to Cannon Fodder. I've seen it. I haven't played it yet. I'll do it on a random encounter soon. Um, uh, yeah, and there's a couple of like, if you are sending me like super passionate criticisms or, of the site or stuff, which I get quite a lot, which I appreciate people sending in because you clearly trust when you're telling me. And um, if I don't respond, it's probably because you're anonymous and I can't privately respond to you. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have an account and you want to ask questions about stuff, positive or negative, um, if it's something I think is for public consumption, I will send it um, to my feed. If I don't think it is, I will be gentle with my words because who knows who's going to take a screenshot, but I will I will reply to you privately rather than um, than publicize. So if, if I haven't responded to you on any of that stuff, it's probably because um, because you don't have a, <clears throat> an account and you're anonymous and there's no way of sending it privately. Um, football Footballution asks, is there an RSS feed for the lobby? I don't think there is because there's currently no way of downloading stuff off the site. Um, so sorry, no, there's not. Um, also, I don't publicly respond to messages that are like people saying super nice things because it makes me feel awkward. But I will respond to you privately. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's it. What's your favorite bitter? Somebody asked me that. I'm gonna say it's Alaskan White. It's not even an IPA, is it? Well, maybe it is. Mm. All right, that's it. Um, I'm playing Infamous Second Son, but I'm uh, I went for a big cycle this morning. I'm not going to go cycle now because I've just had a beer. I think I'm going to sit home and script. We've got PAX next week. Um, we're going to be in... Let me get the details. So we have a PAX panel on Tuesday at 1.30 in the Bumblebee Theatre, um, which is going to have myself, Chris, um, Nathan Vela is going to be there from Capybara. Um, we're going to have a preview of a game that's not been shown yet. Gameplay wise, um, which I believe is a game that's maybe going to be playable there. I don't know actually, um, but I can't tell you what it is um, until the show starts. Uh, we're also going to have Alexander Bruce, creator of Antichamber, Rich Gallup, who used to be of 38 Studios, uh, of Fartcat fame, and of course used to have the job that I do now, who is the reason I do the job that I do now. Um, and we're going to have some other folks in there as well. Uh, to talk about um, stuff. Free shit give, being given away. We're giving away like a PlayStation Vita, a bunch of t-shirts and shit, uh, asking questions throughout the show. We're bringing the set. We're bringing the couch. I don't think we're bringing the Matrix chair, but the guys have printed a, a like 12 by 8 foot, no, it's way bigger than that, 12 by 8 meter, a huge like photograph of the set, which they're going to hang up and we're going to place everything in front of it, which is super dumb. Um which should be fun. And then finally, if I go to the GameSpot Twitter account, I believe details just got posted. Uh, we have a, a sort of a get together type thing um, on Friday, April 11th. It's on from 8 p.m. until 10 p.m. at the Atlantic Beer Garden, 146 Seaport Boulevard. Uh, it's about a 10 minute walk, less from, uh, well, depending which hall you're in uh, from the Boston Convention Center come along uh, it's getting spot and giant bomb we're going to be there we're going to hang out I think there's like free nonsense there as well but mostly just come hang out have a beer wander over say hi we're just going to be there hanging out and talking and shit uh, which should be cool and if you're going to PAX have a blast because it's the best I haven't been in two years 
<clears throat> it's the first, second gig at the time I was in America, and I did a I did a really weird talk on being in the games industry because I'd been in it like six months, um, uh, which was rad. Uh, if any of the folks who went to that one go to this one, that would be awesome. Because hopefully we'll have, hopefully it'll be it'll be bigger, it'll be more people involved. It should be a, a bit more entertaining, um, and it'd be great to see some familiar faces as well. So that's it. Have a great weekend, everyone, wherever you are. It's probably going up late, so enjoy your Sunday. Um, enjoy PAX next week. Watch the lobby, watch the point. <laughs> ah, whatever. Send me messages on Twitter and, and Tumblr for the next one, next time I do it. And uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out. Have a great weekend. Adios. Alaska. Mm.